We've talked quite a lot about the Hubble tension here on the channel. And this, of course, this measurement of the expansion rate of the universe, you measure it in the nearby universe, you get one number, you measure it in the cosmic microwave background radiation, pretty much at the beginning of the universe, you get a different number. And they don't overlap their error bars. And so something's going on, like we don't understand perfectly the expansion rate of the universe. So there's new physics going on. But maybe there's a mistake in the measurements. And it's important to double check all of your measurements very, very carefully. And so my guest today is Dr. Adam Rees. He is one of the most capable uh, error measurement double checkers in existence. He won a Nobel Prize in 2011 for being part of the team that discovered dark energy. And Adam's work is in just measuring the expansion rate of the universe using Cepheid variables with the most precision. He used the Hubble Space Telescope and more recently, he's got his hands on the James Webb Space Telescope and has been able to do even more precise measurements of Cepheid variables, measuring the expansion rate of the universe with even more precision, just narrowing down those error bars to the point that they've almost gone away. We've got a wide ranging conversation here with Adam Reese. We talk about just like, what are Cepheid variables? Why are they so good for measuring the expansion rate of the universe? And then we spend quite a while talking about other methods of measuring the expansion rate of the universe, what's going to work, what's not going to work, how do the new tools coming fit into that capability. It's a fascinating conversation. I think you're going to get a lot out of it. All right. Enjoy this interview with Dr. Adam Reese. Adam, you have revolutionized your new team, the, the Cepheid variable method of measuring distance in the universe. Why are Cepheid variables such an amazing yardstick for measuring distance in the universe? Right. Well, I would say Cepheid variables have been sort of the gold standard of measuring long range distances for about a century since Henrietta Leavitt first discovered that they have a very tight relationship between the period with which they uh, pulsate and their luminosity. Um, and so because they're a star, um, that means that, you know, they're a discrete object. Uh, they're common in the universe. And so, therefore, when we see them far away, because of their uh, pulsations uh, and the particular shape of their light curve, uh, we recognize them to be Cepheid variables because we can measure their periods independent of how far away they are just from their light curve. That zeroes in on what actually turns out to be really the mass of the star. So it's a star of a certain mass. The fact that it is... Uh, varying is because uh, its temperature uh, puts it at a, a particular position in stellar evolution that causes this pulsation. So the consequence is we're dealing with a very specific object, a very specific mass, a very specific temperature. And so that's what makes it such a great distance indicator is the specificity uh, that we have even before we measure the distance. The other thing that makes them fantastic standard candles is they are um, just about the most luminous type of star we know of. They are super giant stars. They live at the top of what we call the color magnitude diagram of all stars. They're the kings or queens of stars. And so uh, this combination of the specificity uh, and the great luminosity makes them excellent standard candles uh, for measuring distances. The fact that we now have observatories that can observe them in the near infrared, uh, which allows us to avoid the, you know, what is in the past been the bane of cosmology dust, which can obscure the, the brightness of an object. Uh, the near infrared allows us to see through the dust. And so we really have sort of everything we need then to make very precise distance measurements. And if you could transport us to a Cepheid variable star system, like, what would we see over the course of this variation period? Right. Well, you know, first of all, just to give some picture of it, if you replace the sun uh, with one of these, uh, that star would be enormous and it would basically engulf the entire solar system. So, you know, the first of all, you'd have to figure out where you want to be to be safe. So, you know, you probably have to be out well past Pluto just to not be immediately incinerated, although, you know, it would still be extremely toasty. Um, and then over the course of 
days, weeks, or months, depending on the size of the star, uh, the entire star would kind of accordion in and out. It would be pulsating. Uh, while it's pulsating, um, you would also see it uh, change its temperature or its color somewhat. Um, you know, it would compress, uh, at which point it would heat up and become very hot. Um, but compress would still be uh, relative. It would still engulf the whole solar system. And then it would expand and it would cool and it would keep going through this oscillation, really like the most fantastic clock you can imagine. So if the, you know, Cepheid had a period of, I don't know, 10.12 days, it would just keep doing that every 10.12 days, not 10.13 or 10.11 days, very periodic. Um, now, over the course of uh, many years, it might slowly shift that period a little bit, you know, maybe by, you know, 0.02 in, in period of days. But really, most Cepheids don't change at all for tens of thousands of years. And then what is the the mechanism inside the Cepheid variable that's driving this accordion-like expansion and contraction over the course of this period? Right. So the star, like any other star, is generating a tremendous amount of energy and heat inside. And generally that energy or heat gets trapped by the atmosphere to some degree uh, or the, you know, the inner layers. And so like any other star, there's a, this exquisite balance between gravity, which is trying to crush the star, and the thermal pressure generated by the heat that's pushing it out. So an ordinary star is in what we call hydrostatic equilibrium. These, these two forces, the, the squishing by gravity and the pushing back by thermal pressure are in balance. But in the case of a Cepheid variable, um, you're constantly overshooting that balance point, kind of like a kid on a swing, you know, will overshoot the bottom. And the reason that you do that is the opacity, the ability of the internal part of the star to trap heat itself depends on the temperature of the star. There's, um, there is generally uh, helium down in the star, and depending on the ionization state of the helium, uh, it may have more or less opacity. And so uh, a Cepheid variable lives around a temperature where the inner atmosphere is right around that transition where helium changes its ionization state. And so when the ionization state uh, makes it more opaque, then it traps in more heat and it's more effective at pushing out the star. And so it'll push it past that, that balance point with gravity. Um, and then as it expands, it cools again. And so the ionization state goes back to the original and now the heat is getting out more easily. And so it acts like, you know, a balloon that you put some holes in. Now it starts squishing down again. And so it's constantly overshooting. Uh, and that's because, it, you know, it lives at that kind of Goldilocks temperature down in that zone and Goldilocks pressure uh, that allows that helium ionization state to change. Uh, this is something I think it's sometimes called the Eddington mechanism. And it goes back to Eddington. You know, this has been understood for many, many decades. And like how common like, these sound extreme, like there can't be a lot of them in the galaxy. Right. They're not very common. First of all, it takes a very massive star to produce one. So, you know, generally we're talking about stars that might be a few to 25 solar masses. And then this is a state that they live in for, you know, a relatively short time in the life of a star, as I said, maybe 10 or, or 100,000 years in that state. Um, and this is a, a state that only occurs for very young stars. So I would say, you know, a galaxy like ours probably has several thousand of these Cepheid variables, but, you know, we're, we're a galaxy with a hundred billion stars. So, you know, these are truly rare objects. And yet when we look at galaxies far away, they are the most luminous and the ones that are varying. So those are very good. Uh, you know, normally I would say it's a needle and a haystack problem, but these needles are, are very large and they're very pointy. And as soon as you place your hand down on the stack, you know, you feel them, uh, so to speak, you know, they're easy to find. They announce themselves. And so, uh, like, when you look at, say, a picture of Andromeda or some other mm -hmm. galaxy, like, right. like the Cepheid variables are contributing a sizable amount of the radiation that's coming from that galaxy. 
You know, I wouldn't say a large percentage Mm. of the radiation, but as I said, they are amongst the brightest stars. So as soon as you have, and this is a trick, as soon as you have a telescope that has the resolution to start separating out individual stars, then you can pick them out. You know, when we, oh, I don't know, we listen to a crowd of people cheering at a football game, um, you know, it's very difficult to pick out individual voices. So, you know, you could have the loudest person there, but, you know, you'll have a hard time separating them. But once you have enough resolution that you could hear the individual voices, now you're definitely going to notice the loudest ones and pick those out. And so that's what we do. Once we have a, a telescope, for example, one in space that has that resolution, then we could take a series of images of a galaxy every few days to every few weeks, maybe over the course of many months. And now we could uh, measure the brightness of individual stars over the course of that few months span and recognize the ones that are varying and they'll vary quite a lot. They will vary by maybe, you know, in the, in the, at visual wavelength, something like a magnitude or, you know, a factor of, you know, five to 10 in their brightness. Right. And I mean, one of the sort of, I mean, we talk about the Hubble space telescope, Mm -hmm. like, like, it's named after Edward Hubble and Hubble did his work measuring the expansion rate of the universe measuring the distance to these Cepheid variables based on the work, as you said, by, by Henrietta Leavitt and, and right. others to sort of right. lay that groundwork. So it's right. Easy. And I would I mean, even go further. I would, I would just point out that one of the main justifications for building the Hubble space telescope was to measure the Hubble constant by observing Cepheid variables in distant galaxies. So generally when you propose to build a great new facility, you have a number of, um, you know, key cases or or projects where you say, you know, this new facility will allow us to do this specific thing that we could never do before. And before the Hubble Space Telescope launched, the value of the Hubble constant was debated to a factor of two, 50 to 100. And many people recognized that, you know, the really the thing that was holding us back was that while we had these Cepheid variables, we could not isolate or resolve them in even some of the nearest galaxies without a telescope with resolution that is enabled by getting above the atmosphere. Um, And so as soon as it launched, there were already a couple of teams in place that had proposed to go out and measure the Hubble constant by measuring Cepheid variables in nearby galaxies. And, and, you know, you, you said that like between 50 and a hundred. So that's like, that's a mega parsecs per second per second. I forget the, the number, right? That's, the expansion rate right. of the universe. Kilometers per second per megaparsec. Right, right, right. Kilometers, Kilometers per, per second se- per me- Right. Yeah. Right. So it's, you know, every time you go out another megaparsec, that piece of the universe will be moving away from us at another, you know, 50 or 100 kilometers per second. Right, right. And that's why the the more distant things are, the faster they're moving away from us. And that sort right. of explains this. Right. Th- this universe that we find ourselves in. Right. Um, now, that's a big error bar. Right, yes, fifty to that 200. was that's correct. That's right. Right, and so the work, your work as well as others' work, was mm-hmm. to bring that number down. So, tell me how you use the Hubble Space Telescope to bring that number down. Right. So first, uh, I want to point out there was a, a generation before us. Uh, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope key project, um, whose goal was to measure the Hubble constant to 10% precision. Um, and they succeeded in doing that by around the year 2000, using the first generation of instruments on the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, but we recognized our, our team, it was called the SHOES team, started around 2005 um, with the recognition that in order to learn more about dark energy, which is this uh, you know, fascinating phenomenon that is accelerating the expansion of the universe, to learn more about it, um, it would be very powerful if we can measure the Hubble constant to sort of percent level precision, because that would be a great complement to the cosmic microwave background in learning about dark energy. Because you know, after the Big Bang, the universe is expanding, um, and the cosmic microwave background witnesses essentially the expansion rate that time shortly after the Big Bang, as well as tells us quite a lot about the model of the universe. And so if we have the right model of the universe, then you should be able to predict how fast the universe would be expanding today, the Hubble constant from that. And if that prediction doesn't match uh, the most generic 
form of the model, which is called lambda CDM, which assumes that dark energy is a cosmological constant, then what you're actually doing is probably measuring how uh, the cosmological constant is not exactly what we have in our universe, that we have some other exotic form of dark energy. So when we started in 2005, we were interested uh, in doing that as a complement to the cosmic microwave background experiments and also realizing that there were there was a new generation of instruments that uh, was being placed on the Hubble Space Telescope that would allow you to push this method further. So the astronauts installed the advanced camera in 2002 and wide field camera three uh, in 2009 and also added infrared, near infrared capabilities to the telescope. Uh, and so this formed the foundation of sort of rebuilding this, this process called the distance ladder to try to reach percent level precision. And so as you were fine tuning your method, you're getting access to this more sophisticated equipment on the Hubble Space Telescope, a completely different team was they had the Planck mission Correct. as well as WMAP. First they had and WMAP. They, they had right. WMAP, First they had and, then WMAP Planck. and then Planck. Right. Right. And they were measuring this cosmological constant within the cosmic microwave background radiation. And you were getting numbers that were kind of similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would say, you know, around 2005, 2009, our early results were, you know, around – 72 to 74, uh, but, you know, with sizable uncertainties of, you know, plus or minus three or four. And the initial measurements from WMAP, the, the NASA satellite, uh, was only measuring, you know, a piece of the CMB spectrum. Uh, they were getting numbers around 70, 71. So everybody was relatively like, this is okay. And yeah, things are yeah. looking fine. <laughs> um, right. But um, you know, from my perspective, there was a pretty significant shift. Around 2011, we really got our error bars down to about plus or minus two and a half. Okay, so we were at like 73 plus or minus two and a half or 74, something like that. And then the Planck first results came out uh, in 2013. And lo and behold, the the value was more like 67, ultimately 67 and a half with very small errors, like plus or minus a half. And the reason is because they had extended the range of measurements of the cosmic microwave background from just not just the, the what we call the low frequency or chunkiest information, but rather also getting the fine scale information. And there's a lot of additional information in there about the state of the universe at early times. And so this, you know, produced kind of a, a change from our, our perspective. This, we didn't see that coming, but, you know, a, a lot of tests. Uh, we're done of the data, and it looks to check out pretty well. Um, at the same time, we continue to push the the methods, primarily calibrating Type One A supernovae, which are exploding white dwarf stars with the Cepheid variables, uh, collecting more and more of them. And as of last year, we've now calibrated forty two of them, which is sort of every Type One A supernova that was available to calibrate in the last forty years. Um, and we got our error bars down to about plus or minus one. And so now we're sitting here at 73 plus or minus one versus 67.5 plus or minus 0.5. And, you know, those are about five sigma, five standard deviations, five times their mutual error bars apart. Um, and so that becomes very serious. Now, talk about this sort of, sort of this method of calibrating Cepheid variables against type 1A supernova because sure. – it it's, feels to me that the, the, the Cepheid variable is the one that's accurate, the type 1A, because they're farther distances, the physics are a little less known. It seems like you go the other way around. You would right. double check yeah, your, so let your me, type 1A so against explain. the Cepheids. Yeah. Right. So, 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 so ideally, we would measure uh, distances geometrically. That would be ideal. So, you know, the Greeks taught us, you know, how to imagine triangles in space. Um, and uh, the concept of parallax that, you know, as the Earth goes around the sun, our perspective on a nearby object relative to a, to a distant one changes. So that measures the angle interior in that triangle whose baseline is the uh, orbit of the Earth around the sun. And so with simple geometry, we can measure distances. That would be great. However, that technique doesn't work beyond the Milky Way because the angles involved become very, very small. The, the baseline of the Earth going around the sun is not very large. And so if you want to measure into deep space and actually see the universe expanding, now you have to calibrate 
types of objects that are very luminous. Um, and so, for example, the Cepheid variables, we don't know a priori exactly how luminous they are. We don't calculate that uh, with a computer. It still would be very complicated to do that. What we actually do is measure the parallax of, let's say, some Cepheid variables in the Milky Way, and that allows us to infer their luminosity from their brightness. Uh, and that would be great, but with the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, we can only see Cepheid variables out to a distance of, you know, maybe 40 or 50 megaparsecs. So that's sort of, you know, not even quite to the nearest supercluster. Um, and that's a still a very small volume. The universe is expanding, but the effects of individual motions become quite comparable to the expansion of the universe. For example, uh, many, many people know the Andromeda galaxy is moving towards us. And so you might go, well, if the universe is expanding, why is Andromeda coming towards us? And the answer is it's pulled by our gravity because on very small scales, like a megaparsec between us and Andromeda, uh, the effect of attractive gravity can dominate over the expansion of the universe. So you really need to get out hundreds of megaparsecs uh, where the effects of individual motions of gravity of galaxies dampens out and you can measure the expansion of the universe. And so we cannot do that uh, that effectively with Cepheid variables. So what we do is we look at nearby galaxies within about 40, 50 megaparsecs where a Type 1a supernova went off in the last 40 years. And we go back with the Hubble Space Telescope and we find the Cepheid variables in that galaxy and we use – the now known knowledge of the distance from the Cepheid variable to calibrate the type 1a supernova. And then the type 1a supernova, we could see all the way out to maybe redshift of one or so. And there's been a lot of work over decades used to uh, calibrate type 1a supernovae and measure distances. This is actually what I did my thesis work on originally uh, and uh, was part of the discovery of the acceleration of the universe. And and so this this distance ladder just sort of takes you from step to step from astrometry, you know, Correct. from, from the parallax in the short. That's right, right. And, and in it, the closest distances, based, right. they overlap right. with Cepheids, and then you go to Type One supernova, and and so on. And I guess that that's right. That and so if I understand, then Hubble was great, but it it wasn't quite able to really do a good job of distinguishing between the the proper motion of these galaxies as they're just kind of drifting around or maybe drifting towards us versus the the stuff that's farther away that you could really lock Correct. in that that expansion. So in the last couple of years, you got a powerful new tool uh, at your disposal, and that, of course, is James right. Webb. That's right. So, so – yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about what the James Webb Space Telescope superpowers are and how they play a role in this story. Um, so James Webb is a much bigger telescope, and the resolution of a telescope in space, if it's well built, um, is mostly a function of the size of the telescope. Also, James Webb is a very cold telescope that's optimized to work in the near infrared, where we want to observe Cepheid variables because then we can see through the dust. So uh, that's great, um, very powerful. And uh, what this does for us, see, when we saw that the Hubble constant was higher than what it was expected to be, um, we were very concerned. People were very concerned. They you know, challenged this in, in many ways and said, maybe there's some mistake in this three-rung distance ladder. You know, some, something occurs along the way. And so over the last decade, because you know, going back to 2013, this Hubble tension has been around and grown in significance for about a decade. You know, people in the community have suggested all kinds of things and all kinds of studies that have been done, but none of them have panned out in terms of an explanation, leaving us with, you know, the most uh, exciting, interesting possibility that there's something we don't understand about the universe. That you know, our ability to predict how fast it should be expanding based on how it looked. 13 billion years ago, you know, depends on our understanding of the universe and maybe there's something missing. So, you know, before going to that, we've sort of been like, you know, going down a checklist of could it be anything else? And one idea people had suggested is maybe when you look at these Cepheid variables in these uh, hosts of type 1a supernovae, despite the fact that using the Hubble Space Telescope, which is the best telescope, you know, best resolution we've ever had, the images are still not sharp enough. Um, and in particular, uh, if you look at maybe you'll you'll end up being able to put up some of these images. If you look at 
uh, some of these Cepheid variables through seen with Hubble, they look like blobs sitting around other blobs, and you have to measure how bright the blob is. Okay, and you know we're 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 paid the big bucks to measure the blobs. Okay, um, and you know we do the best we can, and we do lots of tests of that. But at the end of the day, there's there's nothing quite like you know getting a new pair of glasses, and instead of looking at blobs, you're looking at sharp rays, sharp points. And so that's what JWST has given us. Um, and in a couple of papers over the last six months, my colleagues and I have uh, re-observed the known Cepheid variables that Hubble observed now with the James Webb Space Telescope. And we've observed, we picked the galaxies that were richest in Cepheids, that had the most Cepheids, so they would give us the best statistics. And so now we've observed over a thousand Cepheids um, with the James Webb Space Telescope. And the consequence is that the noise in the measurements comes down dramatically. Um, it's quite dramatic in the figures. If you look uh, in our most recent paper, uh, the overall noise reduces by a factor of two and a half, um, not 10 percent, but two and a half. So, you know, in my lifetime, I have not experienced such a scale of improvement where I was working on something one day for a long time and then said, somebody said, Hey, here, try this instrument. And you're like, wow. Uh, but it is like that. So the great news for really all of us is that we have this great telescope. And I, I have to say, I'm extremely grateful to the people who have spent decades of their lives uh, building it uh, and uh, succeeding with it. So I'm just a user. Uh, but what we saw was that the uh, measurements from the Hubble Space Telescope appear to be right. They are. We can rule out that there was a large uh, error due to the imperfect sharpness of the images from Hubble. In fact, um, in our most recent paper, we show we can rule that out at eight sigma. In fact, we have greater confidence that there's not a problem in the Hubble measurements than we even do about the existence of the Hubble tension. Um, and so, you know, science is a very painstaking process. You know, you make a list of, you know, you see something surprising, you say, could it be this? No. Could it be this? No. And, you know, we're going down the checklist. And this is a very powerful check, this, this one uh, from James Webb. This is essentially seeing the same thing with two telescopes. And one of them is now much better uh, for this purpose than the other. Yeah, and I, I, I sort of imagine you as the person who is like checking the rulers, and you're like, because you, all the astronomers are using these rulers, right. and you are you in there. You use rulers, and then you go, well, how do we know the rulers right? And again, right. this is, you know, if if it weren't for the Hubble tension, if it weren't for the the consequence, what could be new physics in the universe, you know, we'd go, I'm sure the ruler's fine, you know, but in this case, uh, you know, given the stakes, I would say. Um, you know, you sort of check everything and you check everything again and, you know, you get a better telescope and you redo things. Um, but you know, this is, this is just where we are today. I mean, it's a fantastic result. And so you say with, with a signal, so where does that bring your error bars down to now? Where do you think right. we are? So there are, there are sort of, I would say in an experiment, there are sort of two, two kinds of exercises. One where you might collect more data and bring down your error bars. And another where you have a concern, what we call a systematic error, and you check it, whether it exists at all or not. And so the work with James Webb up until now is more of that second variety that it, you know, it checks a concern, uh, a possible systematic error, and it rules it out. Uh, but on the other side of the ledger, just, you know, improving our knowledge of the Hubble constant, um, it's hard to do a lot better. As I mentioned earlier uh, in my talk uh, about this, um, we've calibrated 42 Type 1A supernovae, all the ones that we've seen in the last 40 years that are within range. Um, nature produces a new Type 1A supernova in the volume in which we can, we can measure them with Cepheids about once a year. So, you know, Collecting, doubling the sample will take another, you know, 40 years or so. And so, um, you know, so it's not easy for us by this method uh, to do a lot better. Um, now, you know, some might say, well, you don't need to do a lot better. You already are, you know, five, you know, five sigma, five standard deviations apart. The name of the game is not just 
improving the precision, but, you know, checking things like JWST can do is, you know, is there a, a concern? And so, you know, a lot of our attention has really been there, but um, there are other experiments coming along uh, like LIGO, uh, which can make independent measurements of the Hubble constant uh, and new cosmic microwave background experiments that can make uh, new independent measurements of the model of the universe at early times that could reveal something new. That would be very exciting. So, I mean, the observations that you're double checking and confirming were at the very limit of what Hubble can do. So Correct. now, when you look at the capability of JWST, what right. are the kinds of observations that you think that you could make that would be at the very limit right. of what JWST could do? Right. One thing you could start to do is you could start to use some of these tools like Cepheid variables uh, and other stars that serve a similar role. And you could measure them out so far that, for example, maybe you don't need the type 1A supernova. You, you simplify the measurement but process from three rungs down to two rungs. We did a little bit of that with the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, but the answer was not as precise as using the third rung. Uh, but, you know, that could change with JWST. Uh, in fact, you know, ultimately, you know, a lot of good measurements are about simplifying the process. Um, and so I expect you will see measurements like that over the next few years. I mean, I know that there has been a, you know, because of this Hubble tension, there's people have taken another look at the, you know, how well you can trust a type 1A supernova to be mm -hmm. always right. exploding with the same amount of luminosity. Does right. that feel like, like the kind of thing that, that is now much easier to double check? Um, you can, um, except, and, you know, just so that people have a clear picture of that, what makes the distance ladder method so powerful and sort of hard to, you know, avoid the conclusions we have is you might say, oh, well, what if I just change the luminosity of type 1A supernovae? But that isn't what changes the, the result. You have to change the luminosity of type 1A supernovae in this set of galaxies, the ones where we're calibrating them with, with the James Webb Space Telescope versus another set of galaxies, the ones just a little further out where we're measuring the expansion of the universe. So that's the tricky bit is, um, you know, there, there's, there's a principle that, uh, you know, most of my colleagues and, and I believe in pretty strongly called the cosmological principle, which says that there's nothing special about where we live in the universe. Okay. And so, you know, to, to change the thing I said requires this, you know, violating that in a way that would be, you know, far worse than any tension I could imagine. Uh, it's to say, oh, things are different right around us where we measure them. But, you know, if you go out a little further, then things are different again. You know, the, the kinds of stars you'll see will be different. The kinds of supernovae will be different. Not because uh, the universe was different earlier in its history. We're not looking out very far that we're talking about very much time in the history of the universe. Um, so really, we're just saying there's something funny around us that all galaxies around us and the stars in them would be different. And, you know, that that would be weirder than the weirdness right. that we see. <laughs> right. So, but as you, uh, yeah, Go ahead. but as you said there, like, you know, there's nothing special about where we live in the universe, but there is something slightly special about when we live in the universe. And as That's we right. look That's farther right. away, we are looking back in time. Right. Right. So if we were talking about, you know, out to redshift of, oh, you know, one or, or a half, we'd be talking about billions of years in the past. And, you know, the universe, can and probably is somewhat different then. But when we measure the Hubble constant, the expansion rate of the universe, we're comparing between, you know, supernovae that are calibrated at a redshift of 0 0.01 to the ones that we see at redshift of maybe 0 0.03 or 0 0.04. Um, and so the difference in time is just, you know, 100 million years. Um, and so that's not very much time. All the galaxies, all the universe – uh, around us out at a redshift of 0.03 looks just like the universe does today. That's very little what we call look back time. Um, and so there's, there's never, nobody's ever seen evolution of the universe on that recent a time scale. Now I've done interviews with people who have worked with the Planck mission mm -hmm. and they are just so happy with their result and the precision of it Yeah, and their number. Yeah, it's beautiful work. Yep. And your number are different numbers. Right. And so right. like 
what's where going do on? we go from here? Right. Well, what's right. the what do you well, think is the, the, the right. viable strategy so, to solve this? Right. So, so the most important thing for people to understand when they hear that, that these are different numbers, is that we're not measuring the same thing. Um, so we don't require them to be the same number unless – we really understand the universe well, and so we can tell you a story that goes from the beginning to the end and with sufficient precision that it can predict one number from the other. Um, and so, you know, the, if you're an optimist, you might say your number is only 9% different than their number. Uh, you know, uh, over, you know, 14 billion years, that's like, you know, threading the eye of a needle from, you know, the other side of the moon. I mean, you know, it's it's a long way. And this, you know, extrapolation based on physics that is kind of not that well understood with dark matter and dark energy, it's pretty good, but it's not exactly right. Um, and so what we need is we need ideas, we need new theories uh, that could explain this. And we need, of course, more measurements. Um, we, measure, we need to measure particularly different things. Um, you know, it'd be great if we can make very precise measurements at intermediate times in the history of the universe. So there are new missions coming along like a Roman uh, space telescope from NASA and the Rubin uh, Observatory. There's the European Euclid uh, Observatory that are going to measure the expansion history of the universe between essentially now and high redshift. Uh, and they will tell us, are there any funnies or kinks or, you know, differences that occur there relative to the cosmological model? Um, you know, likewise, uh, one of the favorite uh, ideas for solving this Hubble tension is to change the universe uh, before recombination, before the cosmic microwave background radiation gets out. It's sort of like changing their ruler. You know, their ruler is essentially the physics of the early universe and how uh, a wave can propagate in the early universe until the universe becomes transparent. And the size of that wavelength, which is called the sound horizon, the distance that a fluctuation can travel before the universe becomes transparent. That's their ruler. Um, so if you change the physics of the universe before recombination, you change the size of their ruler, you might solve the tension. But you have to be very careful because if you do it in a way that is uh, uh, too much or too crude or, or it will leave other signatures in the cosmic microwave background that maybe are not seen. Uh, and, and that is the case. There are many solutions that have been posited, uh, but they will lead to other features in the cosmic microwave background that are not seen. But the flip side of that is as we get better data from the cosmic microwave background, we might see features or signatures that are not expected that actually point to the existence of some new or additional physics before recombination. So it's uh, there's, there's a lot of discovery potential, I would say, over the entire cosmic history that might tell us something more about this. Yeah, I mean, I know that there's indirect evidence, say, of a neutrino background in the cosmic microwave background radiation. There is the baryon acoustic oscillations that connect that original universe to right. the large scale structure of the universe that we see around right. us today. And so any slight variation that you want to make to that is going to right. ripple out literally right. into the universe. And so you've got to account for all that if you're going to right. tweak one little variable back in the beginning. Right. But, you know, by the by the same token, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict based on how fast the universe was expanding shortly after the Big Bang, how fast it should be expanding today. And that requires understanding dark matter and dark energy, whose nature we don't really understand well. So what we do is we take the most vanilla guesses about them. In the case of dark matter, we say, okay, let's assume that it only has gravity, that there, it, there's no other force we have to worry about. There's no interactions. There's no collisions we have to worry about. We'll just ignore all those things. For dark energy, we say, we don't know what that is, but let's say it's static. It doesn't change over time uh, and that it's always had this strength and that it is the cosmological constant. And whenever we compare the results from Planck, let's say the CMB, to what we measure locally, that's what we're doing is we're saying, take all the vanilla guesses and when they don't agree, what we're saying is maybe one of those vanilla guesses is not right. When you think about these standard candles and, and yardsticks, I mean, we talked about uh, the parallax method leading to seven variables leading to type 1 supernova, but there have been dozens of yardsticks proposed. 
Right. Uh, and some are really creative. Like I really yeah. like ideas about looking at quasar light moving through intervening right. gas. And there's all these kinds of ideas. Which of these do you think is going to be most powerful to fill in that missing middle? Right. You know, um, it's funny. It's uh, like, uh, you know, with technology, we can invent new technologies. And so, you know, maybe in the future we'll have, you know, some incredible thing, hovercrafts that we didn't have before. But, you know, we don't invent new types of objects in space. This is an observational field. We sort of have the zoo of things that are out there. Um, and so what we really rely on then is somehow understanding them better in a way that means that uh, now suddenly it's, a, it's a, a much better understood object. So when you see it far away, you can tell how far away it is. So it's t- tough to beat the Cepheid variables and the type 1a supernovae because they are the most luminous. The Cepheids are about the most luminous star that exists in sort of a galaxy. And the supernovae type 1a are about the most luminous state that maybe a star becomes for a very short period of time. Uh, But what's so beautiful about the type 1a supernovae is uh, they explode right around the Chandrasekhar mass within, you know, some, some modest... Uh, variation of that. And so that's a, that's a homogenizing factor that produces a great standard candle. Um, what's difficult with the quasars is they come in such a range that, uh, you know, it's very difficult to standardize them and end up with something that's very precise. Likewise, galaxies themselves are very inhomogeneous things. Uh, and so to use them as distance indicators, it's difficult. It's sort of like saying, you know, uh, what's a better standard object, a person or a crowd of people? If I see a person far away, I'm not sure exactly how tall they are, but it gives me a pretty decent idea of how far away they are from how big they appear. If I see a crowd of people, now I'm in more trouble because some crowds of people have 10 people and some crowds of people have, you know, millions of people. Um, and if I can't, you know, pick out individual things in that crowd. I just have to gauge and assume, you know, it's a standard crowd. Uh, if I try to make some some estimates based on that, I'm going to be pretty far off. And so many standard candles uh, that we use, distance indicators are good because uh, they tell us something that, about their nature uh, that allows us to understand them very precisely. So we see one far away, we make a precise uh, measurement. Uh, many others have, have not been. On the other hand, the advantage of quasars is they're the only game in town at redshifts, you know, five to 10. They're the only really luminous thing that you could see well. And so um, unless JWST can actually fi- start finding supernovae out at those redshifts, which is possible, uh, it just hasn't happened yet, um, you know, we don't have many other options. Uh, of course, gravitational waves are another option. Um, they are sort of self-calibrating standard candles in gravitational waves. And future generations of LIGO or LISA, the space-based version, uh, indeed might be capable of reaching out very far. So um, so other things may come along, but I think it's not likely because we discover new kinds of objects uh, as much as we understand the objects we have around us already, but better. Right, right. Um, and I can sort of see that problem with, with Webb because – like. If you knew where to look, you could probably see a brand new Type 1A supernova going off in a galaxy. Right. But the problem That's is right. that you you don't have James Webb's looking in every direction all the time to right. catch those supernovae going That's off right. to know to look. So it's got to be That's accidental right. discoveries of these while well, you happen Correct. to be observing some galaxy. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, a, you know, a typical galaxy might have a type 1a supernova once a century. Um, and so the way we've learned to find supernovae is by taking wide enough angle images that each image contains, you know, a hundred thousand galaxies. And so, you know, you take an image like that every month and one of those is bound to show you something. So, uh, the capability of finding supernovae whenever we want to has really been about having wide angle telescopes. James Webb is not a particularly wide angle telescope. It's, it's more of a narrow field for follow up investigations or, you know, studying very, very distant objects. And so, um, you know, it, it will take a lot of time from James Webb in order to, to find supernovae. Right. And so if someone would be willing to just point Webb at a galaxy for a hundred years at redshift Z, I don't know, five or right. something, then that would be great. Right. But, you know, right. it's busy. Or it's a busy if, telescope. you know, eventually, and I think this will happen, you know, James Webb isn't so new, the pre- time isn't so precious that we can't afford to essentially start covering large areas with the James Webb Space Telescope. So this happened with Hubble as well in its later years. Uh, people start tiling areas 
you know, you could always make a wide field image out of many small field images. And so you tile a large area, you build a mosaic uh, that actually does contain a lot of galaxies, a lot of space. And you come back a month later or a year later and you reobserve it and you digitally subtract one from another. Um, I think that will happen. It's not it's not the first thing that was done with the telescope out of the gate because it takes a lot of time. And, you know, all the, all the astronomers have a lot, a big wish list of, of things they've been waiting to do. That only takes, you know, an hour or 20 minutes or something. And so we're doing those ones first. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the next uh, phase will come pretty soon here. I mean, there are these surveys being done. There's the Jade survey, the Sears survey. Like there's a bunch of these surveys right. that are, that are imaging. And so the question is, if you, are you going to only examine new parts of the sky? Or are you going to come back right. around and check for that's changes? Exactly which- the, that's right. That's right. And so, you know, it's a different area of science. It's very important. And it, it as I said, I expect it will be done soon. But again, you know, the, the first time people with the telescope there, they're going to look at new fields that have never been observed with James Webb. The other interesting phenomenon is, uh, this is a consequence of cosmology, is when you look at high redshift objects, uh, they evolve more slowly because of a phenomenon called time dilation. Um, they actually evolve at, at a normal rate, but as obscene in our frame, uh, this is a kind of a relativistic uh, phenomenon, um, they appear to age as uh, one, one plus the redshift, one plus Z. So, you know, if I'm looking at a galaxy uh, at redshift of nine, you know, uh, what is 10 days for me is only one day for, for it. And so the supernovae we see in those galaxies will appear to change very slowly. What that means is that we need to space out our observations maybe 10 times longer than normally we would. So, you know, if I were going to look every month for a nearby supernova, when I look at a distant one, you know, the same amount of searching will be just once a year. It might take me 10 years what took a year uh, nearby. So this is unfortunately makes the problem harder uh, because, you know, we're, we're sitting here watching a very slowly evolving universe far away. And and there was a piece of news that went around that clocks run slower in the past and people were quite excited about that. And, and I was saying like, this is just, this is just how time dilation works. Like there was a nice, uh, during Garrett Lewis and, and others had sort of done the nice calculation, but this was, you know, fairly well known. Um, so then I want to go back to familiar objects. Can they, you know, we understand the physics, we hope, of Cepheid variables and the type 1 supernova to a certain extent. So is there something in the behavior of quasars, quasars surrounded by accretion disks, right. the polarity of light coming from, right. like, where do you think that those right. next innovations in distance right. ladders might come from? So people are trying, and they already have found found some what I would call standardizing relations. Uh, but the problem is, after the standardizing relation, uh, the variation that's still left is pretty large. Um, it could still be a factor of ten or more. Um, and the problem is, when you have a standard candle, who's that still has a lot of variation in it. Now you start uh, coming up against another bane of cosmology, which is called uh, selection effects or, you know, the selection phenomenon. So, you know, going back to my crowd analogy, you know, you look at a distant crowd and the people you can see are the tallest people in the crowd. Um, And so, you know, you do much better if you start out with a crowd of people whose size has already been, you know, evened out. You know, there was some screening process involved or, you know, you've decided to pick up a class of people, you know, that has a very narrow range of heights. Um, And so the quasars still have too big a range. And so when we see them far away, we know we're only going to end up finding the most luminous ones and they will give us biased uh, measurements unless we can de-bias the measurements. And that itself is can be tricky and, and have uncertainties involved. And so I think we need to make more progress in standardizing them. Um, you know, some of it, uh, variation comes because, you know, the, the black holes at the centers of galaxies that produce the quasars just have a big range of sizes. There's also a big range of environments around them. So some have you know, obscuring materials and dust around them and some don't. And so it becomes a fairly complex problem. It's not, it's not like one object, like a star, like a Cepheid variable or a supernova, but rather it's a little ecosystem there that you're trying to sort of calibrate and model and understand. So you can turn it into a, a distance measuring tool. It's, it's harder. But it, I mean, are there some specific examples of ones that make you think, oh, that's really clever. That's on the right track. I really hope they make progress. 
Right. Well, as, as, as I said, I think the people who are trying to measure quasars are trying to do that. And they're, you know, in some cases, they're using type 1A supernovae as a function of redshift to sort of train or teach their algorithms, uh, sort of like, what is it that varies with the quasars that is allowing us to do that? Um, and, you know, I think there will be progress in that area, especially as the catalogs of quasars get bigger. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's uh, I think it's still uh, hard work. I mean, I think when it comes to the Hubble tension, the the thing you're going to be looking for is the moment when the universe started doing something different from it, that earliest age to the more recent age. You've got this vast amount of time, and be, if they don't match, right. then one possible explanation is that something varied in that right. time. Right. And that, with right. Type 20 supernova, that only gets you out to, I don't know, whatever, 5 billion years right. ago. That's right. That's right. Maybe Redshift 1 or 2, maybe with the James Webb Space Telescope, we'll start getting out to Redshift 3. But, you know, our our ambition is to be able to look back as far as we can. I mean, you know, there's a part known as sort of the Dark Ages, not, you know, our, our Dark Ages here on Earth, but in the universe, uh, sort of after the cosmic microwave background gets out at Redshift of 1,000. And then, you know, before the first generation of stars and galaxies really light up, um, and so you know, there, there will inevitably be some region that we can't really observe, but, you know, hopefully nature won't be as mean as hiding its secrets uh, in, in our blind spot, literally. So uh, It came you know, up with I quantum hope- mechanics. So, That's right. That's right. Yeah, the, they uh, should not play fair. Right, right. Uh, God, uh, what was the uh, expression about God doesn't play dice or throw them uh, where we can't see them? Uh, or sometimes right. he does. I don't know. But uh, anyway, yeah. in our case, you know, we hope that the critical measurements are available to us. So, I mean, we're so early on in this process, and I think it has generated a lot of excitement among astronomers because you've got this genuine mystery that is quite fresh and right. and exciting. And so then that drives funding and proposals mm-hmm. and time on telescopes sure. and things like that. And so which kinds of searches do you think will be most effective – like if, with limited resources, where right. should astronomers be spending their their brain power right. to try and solve this problem, do you think? Right. Well, I think, you know, sort of going through the recent chronology of it, there was a sort of, you know, first discovery of the phenomenon, whatever is causing it. And then there was – and there has been a lot of follow-up of, oh, let's check things. So I think the checking phase is starting to come to an end. I mean, you know, we're never done checking. So, you know, I, I right. can never say there's a day on which we go, stop checking. Uh, but, you know, I, I start think, imagining. You know, yeah. Start right. So – but, you know, after you go through a few iterations of checking – it becomes less and less likely you're going to find something. Then there's a, an element of time involved. You know, it's been, you know, years of seeing this. And so, you know, people, uh, particularly theorists, have been coming up with ideas. Um, and some, many of those ideas don't check out. So, you know, those are ruled out. But now there's a handful of ideas that are like maybe that make uh, some predictions of what we should see. And so now I think we're in the soon starting the phase where we go chasing those predictions. So um, uh, the, you know, the next generation of cosmic microwave background experiments are about to start or are near starting the Simons Observatory uh, and uh, S4. Um, there are new cosmic microwave background data sets. So I think looking for hints of new physics before recombination is a whole element of this story that is very important. Even if, you know, they don't find this thing, you know, that's a very important study to do anyway. There are the, um, uh, as I mentioned briefly, there is this whole parallel way of measuring the dark universe now with gravitational waves. And so um, looking for distant kilonovae, these are in-spiraling neutron stars with an optical counterpart whose gravity waves you measure, that will be an important part of the story. Um, Another profound aspect of all this is it affects how old we think the universe is. And so if the universe really has the the, has had the lower Hubble constant, the one we see from the cosmic microwave background, then it's older. You know, it's 
the number we often say 13.8 billion years old. Um, if it actually has this higher Hubble constant and, you know, we've been sort of miscalibrating the cosmic microwave background, the universe could be a billion years younger. And so, you know, I expect, you know, more studies. It's a little harder, but studies of the age of the universe, the age of objects in the universe, that's a whole other, it's probably harder because, you know, it involves theoretical modeling. It isn't just a measurement process. Um, but you know that's something that that uh, can be done, and I think there are some promising avenues as well. There, uh, other tools. Uh, there are other kinds of stars, red giant stars, uh, asymptotic giant branch stars, other things. They don't live quite as high up in the uh, color magnitude diagram, the hierarchy of stars, but they're still luminous enough to see with the James Webb Space Telescope. So there's work going on there that I think looks very promising. Um, you know, it's a very kind of interdisciplinary problem, I would say. It's not like I can tell you, oh, once we do this experiment, it will solve it, partly because we don't quite understand what's causing it. Uh, but I think this kind of interdisciplinary nature of collecting, you know, new ways of looking at the universe is likely to either address this or maybe even tell us something new. Um, I think what people often don't appreciate is we're not very satisfied with where we are, even without this Hubble tension. Um, you know, dark matter and dark energy make up 96% of the universe, and we don't really understand them. And we sometimes lull ourselves into kind of a complacency by saying, well, it's dark matter and it's dark energy. But those are, you know, those are words. And <laughs> the words, you know, have a, a very, uh, you know, I would say naive story behind them uh, with a lot of physics we don't understand. And so uh, I think if if we if we uh, are in that state of not understanding, we need to be looking at new phenomenon and new measurements anyway, because we need to put some some more you know meat on the bone of the understanding of dark matter and dark energy. Even if the Hubble tension is or not related to it, uh, you know, I'm I'm very hopeful that we get some more clues about those. But I mean, we think about the sort of the generations of the telescopes, and yeah. you know. James Webb was initially designed as a next generation telescope. You know, I'm sure when John Mather was planning out the capabilities of James Webb, he wasn't thinking like, oh, Adam's going to love no. this when he wants to make some Cepheid variable measurements. No. But it turned out that it was perfect for this job. And so right. this Hubble tension is relatively new, say maybe within the last decade right. that we're starting to really right. understand the consequences right. of it. And yet right. all of the instruments that are coming online, both in terms of the giant telescopes on Earth, Vera Rubin, the space-based telescopes that you mentioned, even the next generation stuff that's in the works like, say, LISA that just got like approved right. yesterday um, that I'm recording this. Uh, right. These are all maybe answering last generation's questions. Right. Do you think there is an instrument needed to – like if you were to sort of envision right. the perfect instrument to solve right. the Hubble tension – what would it be, do you think? Right. So um, I think one of the reasons we've been fairly successful in space-based astronomy over the last few decades is we uh, – sometimes we build a small targeted mission to do a certain something, you know, Planck or WMAP are great examples of that. But then sometimes we, we build facilities with a broad range of capabilities. Um, and the broad range of capabilities then can address whatever problems come up while you're building the telescope or, or what's most relevant at the time you launch it. And then, you know, we have a time allocation committee that awards the time and what to do with it sort of year by year as we see what's going on. And so, you know, that's what has allowed, you know, Hubble, the telescope or James Webb to be you know, very relevant. We're not doing science that we expected to do 30 years ago when we first thought about building James Webb. We're doing, you know, current cutting edge stuff. So what I would advocate instead of trying to build the instrument to solve the Hubble tension is, you know, generally to look at the capabilities that we have and to see which windows are most covered, you know, where, where we're most blind uh, and look there, build that capability. And then, you know, we'll figure out when it's built you know, the, the unique ways that will address some of these problems. But, you know, because this is an observational science, it's really about getting the broadest view in terms of wavelength, in terms of resolution, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, time we can look back or energy scale, you know, and that I think has ultimately been the most productive way of making progress on a, a large range of problems. And so where do you think we are most blind? Yeah, well, you know, um, the James Webb Space Telescope, for example, is a near-infrared telescope, which is fantastic, highest resolution ever. Uh, but, you know, 
once we uh, go down that road, right, we have we want to continue to uh, um, improve our capabilities in the optical or in the ultraviolet. These are areas that Hubble did very well, but now Hubble was designed, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. It's been up there a very long time. So, you know, I think, and I, uh, you know, many of my colleagues agree uh, that we need to plan for a large scale space optical UV telescope. Um, and this is sort of the capability we need to look for life around other planets. Uh, it uh, is that this is the energy where Cepheid variables put out most of their energy. There's a lot of advantages there. And, you know, Hubble's getting very long in the tooth. Um, and so I think that is probably, you know, the future um, is going to be involved in building that. That's the number one recommendation of the decadal survey. Uh, but it's going to be hard. It's going to take a lot of time to build. But it, I mean, and it'll be amazing. Um, and yes. But that gets us back to sort of our closer environment. I mean, do you see a need for a far infrared instrument sort of at the same scale as James Webb to look even earlier into the universe? Bigger? Right. I mean, telescopes are funny in that, you know, it seems like faraway objects are faint. And so we just want to build a bigger and bigger telescope to chase them. But, you know, we see the furthest back with the cosmic microwave background, which, you know, does breaks that paradigm because, you know, we're now looking at different – phenomena. Um, and, uh, you know, it may be though, ultimately we want a, you know, gravitational wave telescope that can see the ripples from the big bang after inflation. Um, you know, people have talked about that as well and at different frequencies. So, um, you know, it, it really comes back to, you know, what you're trying to look at and, you know, what capability you need. It's not, um, unfortunately it's, it's not sort of a, a one dimensional axis of bigger equals better, but you know, it's, uh, it's this more complex, uh, you know, these are instruments at the end of the day. And, you know, like when a, you know, a doctor goes to do surgery, they're not like, Oh, this is hard surgery. Give me a bigger saw and a bigger saw, you know, but like, you know, they're like, no, now I need lasers or now I need, you know, this other kind of instrument or, you know, all kinds of other probes or tools or whatever. We're not just like a bigger saw. So, uh, you know, that's the that's the place we're in. We we passed the point of just we need bigger and now we need, you know, more optimized for, you know, uh, what we can do. Um, you know, there's a new generation of ground based telescopes as well. The extremely large telescopes. I know it's not a very uh, uh, exciting name, but, you know, it's pretty descriptive, which are going to be the biggest light buckets. So that's just to observe the faintest things, even if we don't always have the resolution that we have from space or with adaptive optics, we may get back some of that resolution. Um, and so those are underway being built on uh, Europe in the US and uh, those uh, may show us things as well. So just like a lot of glass would be a great. lot of glass. Yeah. Adam, what are you obsessed with right now? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still in the midst of we have James Webb Space Telescope data coming in and we're trying to squeeze everything we can out of it. You know, when these telescopes work, you know, you want to make hay while the sun shines. And so we're trying to learn everything we can uh, from that data. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of what's most present right now, but also uh, involved in looking at the, for example, the Roman Space Telescope, which is due to launch in just a couple of years, going back to the area I started in measuring type 1a supernovae and the acceleration of the universe uh, to see whether there are any inclinations that uh, the dark energy equation state is not the cosmological constant. Um, those are, you know, those remain very pressing uh, questions. Well, can you get a second Nobel Prize? Like if you solve <laughs> if if you solve that, right. will they give you another um, one? How does I, that work? Right. I I think uh, I think it's unlikely. I think um, you know maybe literature or economics would be more likely. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. Okay. You got to branch out into some other field. Right. Well, Adam, right. it's been a pleasure talking to you, and it's so great to hear sort of the story from the person who made a lot of the groundbreaking breaking discoveries in this in this field. And it sounds like an exciting time. You you do sound a bit like a kid in a candy store with the yeah. most fun tools available right. to you. Not to mention the ones that are coming shortly. So I'm Absolutely. guessing you're going to be very busy and, for the coming and, years. And I just want to take one moment just to say, you know, that. Uh, there's a tremendous team of people who have built these telescopes and other teams who are using these telescopes to as much or better productivity than we are. Um, and, you know, this is really a community's effort um, to understand, you know, the universe around us and these surprising phenomena. So, um, you know, it takes a cosmic village 
uh, to do this. And uh, I think that uh, ours is very fortunate to uh, have the facilities we have right now. Well, thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Adam Reese. I know I did. Uh, it was amazing. And I'm going to talk some more about my sort of thoughts about this interview. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Hey Twilight, Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Ansis, Joel Yancey, and Tony Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Chiplin, Modzo, George, David Gilton, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. We find ourselves in the middle of a mystery. And in this case, the mystery is how fast is the universe expanding? And from that, we get other questions about how old the universe is. What is the nature of dark matter, dark energy? All of these questions are intertwined. And we are in the middle. We don't know the answer. And this is an experience that scientists and those who watch science unfold have been through throughout all of scientific history. There was a time when people didn't know how the sun worked, a time when they didn't know how gravity worked. But yet, slowly, carefully, meticulously, Scientists have worked out the pieces and the details and build towards this scientific consensus of what's going on. And this is our generation's big mystery, big questions in astronomy. And when we get out the other side, maybe it'll take better tools, maybe it's gonna be better techniques, but we will have a better understanding of this universe that we live in. But don't be impatient, let it unfold, enjoy the ride. Enjoy each one of these new discoveries, each piece of evidence as it gets set atop the larger and larger pile of evidence that starts to lean towards one conclusion or another. And we are so early on to this process, but I'm finding it just so entertaining, and I hope you are too. Now, I've done a lot of interviews that are very kind of similar in a similar light to this, but one of the interviews that I think you'll really enjoy is the one that I had with the other Nobel Prize winner that I talked to recently, John Mather, we talk about his development of the James Webb Space Telescope, as well as his ideas for what kinds of future observatories, maybe use a star shade as a way to block the light for Earth based observatories to be able to see planets around other stars, some pretty creative ideas, you can see he's got a lot still to offer to the astronomical community. All right, we'll see you next time.